What are the most common pitfalls and mistakes for you to avoid when treating patients with iron deficiency? When I'm treating a patient with suspected iron deficiency, I order iron, ferritin, TIBC, and transferrin or iron saturation levels. This is because I'm trying to clarify if they have iron deficiency or anemia of chronic disease. And so for iron deficiency, you're going to see a very typical pattern, and that's going to be low iron, high TIBC, low ferritin and a low iron saturation. So less than 10% is basically definitely uh, iron deficiency. And if it's less than 20%, then it's highly suggestive as well. In contrast, when you see anemia of chronic disease, you'll see low or sometimes normal iron. You will see low TIBC compared to the high TIBC here, and you will see high ferritin, okay? So this high ferritin basically tells you that the patient's iron stores are actually adequate. They're just not able to use those iron stores because of the chronic inflammation that they're having. So let's take a look at some examples. So for this patient here, they have low iron, they have high TIBC, an iron percent saturation less than 10%, and ferritin less than 30. So what is this? This is going to be iron deficiency anemia. In contrast, we have this patient here who has low iron levels, they have a low TIBC, they do also have a low iron percent uh, saturation, but then their ferritin is actually elevated, okay? So this is going to be anemia of inflammation or chronic disease. Now let's talk about who needs iron replacement. So first of all, if you have anybody with iron deficiency as defined by the criteria we just talked about, the ferritin less than 30 and the iron saturation less than 10 to 20%, and they have anemia, then they definitely need to be treated for iron deficiency. If they don't have anemia, it's still a majority of patients should receive treatment. But there's a couple different patient populations that actually have slightly different criteria for whether we're gonna treat them for iron deficiency or not. So with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, we actually have slightly more lenient goals. So if their ferritin is less than 100, then treat them for iron deficiency. Or if their ferritin is less than 300 with an iron saturation less than 20%, then we'll treat them for iron deficiency. And this is based off the FAIR HF trial, which basically evaluated patients with mild anemia and symptomatic heart failure and found that their quality of life and kind of their six minute walking test all improved with IV iron treatment. In patients with CKD, we also use a more lenient ferritin uh, level of less than 100 uh, and iron saturation less than 20%. Or if their hemoglobin is actually less than 10%, then even if their ferritin is less than 500 and iron saturation less than 30%, we will actually favor treating these people as well. So here's an example of a patient um, who either if they had CHF with reduced ejection fraction or CKD, you know, here they have low iron, they have low iron percent saturation, and they have a moderate range ferritin. So despite having this relatively normal ferritin, if this patient has heart failure or CKD, this is somebody we would want to favor treating. So next, let's actually talk about how to actually replace somebody's iron. So first, we're going to talk about calculating how much iron to give, IV versus oral iron, and how to choose that, IV options and oral options and common side effects you should be aware of, and common pitfalls and mistakes, and then things to follow up on after you start a patient on iron replacement. So first, how to calculate how much iron to give. This is going to be calculated by the Ganzoni equation, which you can find on MD Calc. And usually, you want to target a hemoglobin of 12 in women or 13 in men, and it's very simple to use. You just put in the patient's weight, their target hemoglobin, so let's say 13 for a male, their actual hemoglobin, which is 10, and if they're an adult, you just put 500 for their iron stores, and it'll actually tell you how much iron this patient needs. The thing is, uh, this actually may not be necessary. So the, there is actually this firm trial which showed that there was no evidence that replacing iron more than 1,000 milligrams was clinically useful. So um, patients received 1,000 milligrams of IV iron versus 1,500 milligrams of IV iron, and there was no significant significant difference. And how much iron does one unit of packed red blood cells contain? That's about 250 milligrams of iron. So when you are replacing somebody's iron and they've already received several blood transfusions, this will give you an idea of how much more do you actually really need to give them. Now let's talk about when to choose IV versus oral iron. So IV iron may be preferred in heart failure just because this is how the studies used it. And the studies really didn't look at oral iron. In general, if somebody's outpatient, you're probably going to favor oral iron for sure. Um, but there's other reasons that you might want to choose IV iron. That's if somebody is highly symptomatic from their anemia. Uh, they have ongoing blood loss that requires a little bit rapid, more rapid rate of replacement. Um, they can't tolerate oral iron due to GI side effects. Uh, if they have gastric surgery or some kind of malabsorptive process, which would make oral iron not as effective, 
or if you have a personal clinician preference to replace their iron stores more quickly. Now, IV options, we have iron dextran, iron sucrose, ferric gluconate, and ferric carboxymaltose. This is the one that was used in a majority of the studies, at least from what I could tell. But the ones that I use the most often is really going to be honestly, iron sucrose. I don't really use iron dextran that much, but it's good to know the different things that you can do with these IV iron formulations. So iron dextran can be given as a one-time dose. You can give honestly 1000 milligrams all in one shot. So that's really uh, effective. But there is a risk of anaphylaxis with iron dextran. And this really occurred more with the old uh, formulations, which was using high molecular weight iron dextran. Nowadays, they use low molecular weight iron dextran. So the risk of anaphylaxis is significantly lower. And basically, uh, because of that history of anaphylaxis being caused by this, usually what you're going to do is you're going to give a 25 milligram test dose of iron dextran strand. And then after an hour, if they tolerate that well, then you can give them the full 1000 milligrams. For iron sucrose, uh, this one's just very simple. So I like to just give 200 milligrams times five days, and that'll get you to the 1000 milligram mark. The dosing range for ferric gluconate is 150 to 250 milligrams times multiple doses. And for ferric carboxymaltose, uh, I've never actually personally used this, but it appears to be 750 milligrams uh, in one to two doses uh, separated by seven days. So these are your main options for IV iron replacement. And really, just again, iron dextran, iron sucrose, definitely know the side effect of iron dextran when you're going to give that one. Now, let's talk about oral options and considerations. Honestly, I just put the two most common ones here. That's going to be ferrous sulfate and ferrous gluconate. And first, I just want to talk about the most common side effects because uh, oral iron replacement definitely has a lot of side effects that you should know about. The most severe ones or the most significant ones are going to be constipation and then turning the stool black. But the big thing to note is that this is different from melana, okay? So melana is tarry. Patients are going to have diarrhea with black stools that are tarry and very liquidy. Uh, but the black stool from iron uh, use is going to be basically hard constipated stool. So that's the difference there. So what is the ideal frequency for giving oral iron replacement? And this is probably one of the most common mistakes that people make is that actually we prefer giving it every other day. And every other day has been found to not only decrease side effects, but also actually have increased absorption compared to once a day dosing. And there's a couple times that I see patients who are on iron three times a day and I'm like, holy cow, they're just going to become so constipated and they're probably not even absorb absorbing as well as if they were just taking it every other day. So in terms of dosing for ferrous sulfate and gluconate, usually it's going to be 325 milligrams every other day. Uh, for both of these. Now, personally, I generally order ferrous sulfate. I'm just a little more familiar with that. But the big difference is that this one is going to have 65 milligrams of elemental iron, uh, whereas ferrous gluconate is going to have 36 milligrams of elemental iron. And so really, the ferrous sulfate is going to replace the stores a little bit quicker. Um, but sometimes if somebody's having a constipation or GI side effects that's limiting them, uh, there is actually some evidence that going for the ferrous gluconate with the lower levels of elemental iron uh, uh, does reduce some of those side effects a little bit. Now let's talk about if the patient should be taking their iron with or without meals. The answer to that is going to be taking it without food is actually shown to improve absorption. Should they take it with vitamin C? You're going to see this all the time. Take iron with vitamin C to improve absorption. The evidence for this is actually not that strong. Also, there's these enteric coated iron uh, formulations. And really the strong suggestion for this is to not do enteric coated uh, iron. The reason for this is basically it's going to go further down your intestinal tract and it's going to reach areas where iron is not even absorbed. So remember from medical school, uh, iron fist bro is the mnemonic for where different things are absorbed in the small intestine. So iron is going to be absorbed in the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. Folate is going to be absorbed in the jejunum. And then B12 is absorbed in the ileum. So if you give them an enteric coated uh, pill and it just travels all the way to the ileum before it starts actually uh, getting absorbed, you've already passed the main area where iron is going to be absorbed. So uh, your absorption is obviously going to be affected. All right. And now a couple things about follow-up. So outpatient, remember that all patients should get a colonoscopy if they have iron deficiency anemia and you have no clear source. And one of my YouTube comments actually recently taught me that uh, actually the USPSTF recommends screening for colon cancer as a grade B recommendation uh, starting at the age of 45 now instead of the age of 50. A couple other interesting questions. So how soon does pagophagia resolve or, you know, the desire for eating ice or other 
hard things, uh, also known as pica. Um, that actually is going to immediately resolve when you give somebody their first dose of IV iron. And then in terms of improved feelings of well-being, that's generally going to take a few days before a patient really starts noticing those quality of life benefits. Uh, relief from restless legs. A lot of these patients are going to have restless legs. That also takes about three days or 72 hours. And then when are you going to expect to see a rise in their hemoglobin if they had anemia? That's actually going to be within one to two weeks. Finally, the last question is when should you repeat iron studies? So after you've started IV replacement, you want to check their iron studies again in two weeks if you started them on oral iron or six to eight weeks if you gave them IV iron. And then basically the reason you check this is because you want to keep giving them iron until their ferritin and iron saturation normalizes. So that's it. That's iron replacement in a nutshell. Uh, we went over the IV formulation, some of the different side effects and doses, uh, our oral options, and probably the most common side effect, which is to give oral iron every day or even multiple times a day when really we should be giving it every other day. If you enjoyed this content, please make sure to like and subscribe for more stuff like this in the future. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.